Okay. Our first speaker is a gentleman by the name of John Lees. Now, I checked with him this morning. I, I hope I don't make you blush, John, but basically he is a marketing and sales guru. He is the author of 11 books. You might know a little bit about him. He actually is, uh, I suppose, most famous for his career with Schwarzkopf in Australia, New Zealand and eventually around the world. He began there as the marketing and sales director and he took those divisions to the top of their class in the world. He was then of course recruited for his exceptional talent to the German headquarters where of course he was the global marketing consultant and took that to the top of its field as well. To speak to you now on the art of helping the best get better Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. John Lees. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Thank you to Saxton for the uh, invitation. Thank you for the warm welcome. My eldest son lives here in Melbourne, but I'm based in Sydney, so last night I stayed at the Hilton next door, which I can highly recommend. I was greeted personally by the general manager of the hotel. That very rarely happens. He was very British, you know, spoke that kind of accent, you know kind of accent that belongs to a man who's so snobbish he wouldn't travel in the same car as his chauffeur. Do you know what I mean? Yes, the kind of man who takes his first Viagra tablet and instead of swallowing it, he chews it and ends up with a stiff upper lip. Do you know? Yes. Anyway, he said to me, welcome to the Hilton, Mr. Lees. I want you to know this is not your hotel. Equally, I want you to know it's not my hotel. Mr. Lees, this is our hotel. I said, good, let's sell it. <laughs> he didn't agree with that. Now, um, as Katrina said, my areas of uh, interest and experience are in sales and marketing. Uh, before I get started, two or three things to clear up, if you don't mind. Uh, number one, Katrina mentioned that I was with uh, Schwarzkopf. Have you ever heard of Schwarzkopf? Yeah, well, if you have, you will know that it's a hair care company, and knowing that and seeing me, I do feel I owe you an explanation. I don't think there's any point in denying it. I could sense what you were thinking the moment I got up. How is it possible for him to have worked for a hair care company? Thank you very much. Well, for your information, I had to test opposition products. <laughs> I've just recently embarked on a rescue strategy of not using hair conditioner in the mornings in the hope that I'll get split ends, and it will then appear as if I've got double what I've got. I know it's a long shot, I realize that. People say, when did you first notice you were losing your hair? Well, it was taking longer to wash my face. <laughs> then people would say to me, do you realize you're losing your hair? Like as if I'd been more responsible, I would have somehow saved it. <sighs> and I hope you don't tell anyone this, but just recently I've started using L'Oreal. <laughs> why? Because I'm worth it, that's why. <laughs> there we go. The other thing I wanted to clear up is you may be thinking, oh, he's a little older. Does this mean he's going to be old-fashioned? Absolutely not. A man accused me recently of being old-fashioned. Do you know what I said to him? Fiddlesticks. <laughs> Poppycock. And then I told him to skedaddle. I'm just joking, of course. Seriously, I hope you find my short session this morning to be fully sick. <laughs> my great fear of getting older is not losing hair and getting lines. I hate that, just like everyone else does. My great fear, as a man of getting older, is that my trousers go higher every year. Have you noticed this? <laughs> yeah, this is, it happens to every man. There's nothing he can do about it. There are younger men here today saying, it won't happen to me, it will happen to you. The older a man gets, the higher they go. And we should ask ourselves, why does this happen to a man? Does he arrive at a certain point and his body begins to collapse into his trousers? Does he get to a certain point and cannot remember what size trousers he takes? Does he one day become confused about his own height? Well, I don't know, but what I do know is if this continues, you can get into your back pocket over your right shoulder. <laughs> the other thing that happens to a man, of course, is that eventually his tie goes straight down into his trousers, <laughs> which is a good look, I think you'll agree. I have a vision of myself in my 80s of just a belt and a head. After that, you may have to pull down the fly just to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we go. Now, the other thing I just wanted to clear up is, uh, Katrina mentioned, Lees has written 11 books, and I have. I love writing, and I don't like to be boastful. I don't, but that's 10 more than God. 
<laughs> so there are the books. There are the books on my favorite topics of uh, selling and service and marketing and leadership and so forth. They're all related uh, subjects. And uh, I have a new book coming up soon called How to Be Happy Without Money. It's $90, and I do hope you'll get a copy of that. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, people in business, I work with women and men who are real professionals in business. Not perfect, but real professionals in business. And people in business, consciously or otherwise, form themselves into a human pyramid. So there's the pyramid of people in business. And you're in there somewhere, and I'm in there somewhere. And then you get to see all of the results generated by these people. I don't just mean dollars and cents, by the way. I mean that every year your clients get more out of you, your staff have an opportunity to grow and develop and become successful. The business is successful by whatever measures you hold dear, sales, profit, reputation, etc. <clears throat> On a day like this, thanks to uh, Saxton, we are reminded that very few people at the top generate most of the results. I'm sure that's not a big surprise. I am not talking about big business up here, I'm just talking about progressive business. So here you have one-man bands all the way through to medium and very, very large organizations. These people understand the dictionary definition of the word winning, which of course is known to all athletes, but not to many business people. The dictionary definition of the word winning is progress through enjoyable struggle. It's supposed to be enjoyable and it's supposed to be a struggle. That's why we have so many people that have suffered through recent times because they were hoping it wouldn't be that way. It will always be that way, or it should be that way. <clears throat> These people are fat, thin, tall, small, young, old, female, male, black, white. There's no external mold about these people, but there is a couple of things internally that drives these people. Number one, they sell more than they charge for. They sell more than they charge for. Just to give you an example, what does a restaurant sell? Just quickly, what does a restaurant sell? Food is the first thing you think of, isn't it? But it can't be food. Because if it was food, it would be the most expensive place in all the world to buy food. And it's not service, because if it was service, we'd be going there to meet the staff. So what is it? What does a restaurant sell? What do we buy? A pleasant experience. That's it. But what do we then charge for on the way out? Food and drink. So in a restaurant, there is a value gap between that which is sold, pleasant experience, versus what is charged for. This is a value gap. It must be preserved and built in every business, and yet in some businesses there is no value gap. What they sell equals what they charge for. Very dangerous situation. This is not a tactic, by the way. This is the kind of people you are, the kind of business you run. When you sell more than you charge for, you then generate contagious enthusiasm and you want to go and tell people about your particular offering. Have you ever noticed that when friends or relatives have read a book or seen a film and they want you to enjoy it as much as they have, that number one, they don't ask permission to tell you about it, and number two, they don't take all day to tell you about it? These people never ask permission to do their work. Professionals don't do it. People in sales should not do it. <clears throat> My own brother recently was recommending a book to me. He's a little older than I am, quite ugly. Um, he can't help that, and he is ugly. Um, he has a sort of a flattish head. Awful, really. But anyway, this is how he recommended a book to me recently. He said, John, he talks to me in a patronizing way. Uh, John, have you read the book written by Hitler's secretary on life in the bunker before the fall of Berlin? Have you read that book? I said, no, is it good? He said, it's very good. You get that book. Get the... I said, OK, I'll get the damn book. That's how he recommends books to me. And we were always like that. As children, we used to fight hammer and tongs. But I always won because I had the hammer. Maybe that's why he's got a flat head. <laughs> he had it coming. So, these people sell more than they charge for. They've bought what it is they're trying to sell. They generate contagious enthusiasm. Then we come to the base of the pyramid, and an enormous number of people generate next to nothing, which is sad and interesting because these people are made of exactly the same human fabric as these people here. So the big question is, why do so many do so little? Well, there's a reason for it.